Hi everyone, this is Alex and this video is my humble attempt to make the PPR workflow for random man as clear as possible in order to get expected results and to know how to use PPR materials created in such software as Quixel Didu or Substance Painter. We are going to use Blender and Maya to illustrate the physically based rendering aspects and the workflow of using the specific textures. First, I will quickly describe the PBR basics to make sure we speak the same language and use the same principles in creating materials, which are more or less physically accurate. Then we'll see how the PBR principles are usually implemented in Blender Cycles Renderer, just because it will be much easier to understand and illustrate the theory. After that, we'll go through Pixar Disney and Pixar Surface shaders, their settings and how they are related to PBR workflows. Next, I will explain the difference between metalness and specular workflows. And finally, we will see how to use Quixel Didu textures for both metalness and specular workflows in RenderMan. At the time this video is being recorded, Blender add-on for RenderMan has some minor bugs and we will see them through this course. So I hope it will help to address them quicker and it may not be an issue when you are watching this video. So let's get started. I'm not going to explain PBR in detail to save you time, because there are many wonderful explanations out there. For example, Andrew Price, Blender Guru's video, How to make photorealistic materials, and this article at Marmoset by Jeff Russell, which we are going to use as a guide to point out basic statements. I will leave all the links in the description below, so I highly recommend to watch them first if you have no idea about PBR at all. First of all, PBR is all about consistency in every lighting situation, which means that since the shading system follows the laws of physics, it will automatically adjust to every change an artist makes while maintaining natural, realistic look. So we need to point out a few fundamental statements. The first energy conservation law is that diffusion and reflection are mutually exclusive. As you can see in the picture, when light hits the surface, it can either be reflected this is called reflection, or it can penetrate inside the surface, scatter around, and then again, either come out from the surface at a random angle, this is called diffusion, or get absorbed inside. In Blender, these two processes of diffusion and reflection are computed by the nodes Diffuse and Glossy PSDF, which are mixed together by the mix shader node, making sure that the first statement of their balance is followed. By changing the factor value, we define how much diffusion or how much reflection we need, and it will automatically take care that the more reflection you have, the less diffusion you get, and vice versa. At the maximum and minimum points of this parameter, you get either full reflection or full diffusion. This is important. The second important aspect of PBR shading is recognizing that metals and dielectrics which are basically everything else, are two different categories of materials. Dielectrics usually have more diffusion and tend to have 0-20% to reflection, whereas metals have almost no diffusion at all and have 60-90% to reflection. Sometimes metals are said to be 100% reflective materials, but this only means that they have no diffuse. But actually, as I said before, they reflect only 60 to 90% of light. The other part gets absorbed by the surface and transferred into heat. Another difference between them is that dielectrics have only white reflection and metals can tint their reflection, getting their apparent color by doing so. For example, gold. So in Blender, whenever the factor value of the mix shader is set somewhere between 0 and 0.2, and the glossy color is white, we get the behavior of the dielectric material. And when we use only glossy shader and change its color, we get a metal material. In case of metals, to show that some amount of light is absorbed, we simply decrease the value of the glossy shader color, making the metal darker or brighter. For now is the third important principle in PBR shading. Basically, it makes sure that for all materials, reflectivity becomes total for grazing angles, or in other words, any substance can act as a perfect mirror on its edge, 
if it's smooth enough. Everything has for now, so all the materials are equally reflective at a grazing angle, as it is seen in this graph. Both chrome and rubber had the same reflectivity at the edge, but different base reflectivity at the facing angle. The shape of this curve is defined by what is called an IOR, index of reflection. Usually, reflectivity of dielectrics does not vary too much, so an artist should not bother about it. Just make sure that Fresnel is on. For metals, it does change, so it should be tweaked. In Blender, to make it simple, we can use the standard Fresnel knob and plug it into the factor input. Because Fresnel function is nothing but a grayscale map or gradient which drives the proportions of mixing the shaders, we can see that in the center, at the facing angle, we get more diffuse shader and at the edge, more glossy shader. And regarding the IOR, although its value may change dramatically from one material to another, but practically no one will ever see that the golden ring in your render has a wrong IOR as long as it looks like a golden metal. So it may not be worth messing with it or ever changing. Something like 1.5 will always work well to make any believable material, although not 100% realistic. Blender's standard Fresnel node has one drawback. It doesn't change with the roughness of the surface, whereas in reality the surface roughness diminishes Fresnel very quickly. The fourth basic principle of realistic materials states that microscopic grooves, cracks and lumps on the surface, which is called roughness or glossiness of the surface, affect the reflection a lot, making it blurry in case of rough surfaces and sharp for glossy surfaces. In Blender, we have two roughness parameters, diffuse and glossy. Diffuse roughness is something different. It makes the surface look more powdery, dry, and softer. What we need is reflection roughness. As you can see, it changes the look of the material dramatically. This behavior must follow the second energy conservation law, which states that when changing the roughness of the material, it must reflect the same amount of light but spreading the highlights across the surface, making them blurry and apparently dimmer. Or in other words, Microsurface roughness directly affects the apparent brightness of reflections. So in PBR system, you don't have to manually control the reflectivity of scratches or smudges, it will happen automatically. And another important conclusion is that because reflectivity does not vary too much, at least for non-metals, the roughness of the surface will play a more important role in the appearance of the material. For example, in this picture, Mud and water have the same reflectivity of 5%, but water is much glossier, which makes it appear much brighter with clear reflection and look very different from mud, which is much rougher. Blender has a very simple and straightforward logic of its shader nodes, so let's see first how the PBR setup works in cycles, and then we'll move to Renderman, as it will help us to understand how the later works. One of the most common setups is to have two separate known groups for dielectrics and metals. These ones I've made inspired by Andrew Price videos on PBR in Blender. This shader group for non-metals has the parameters which we already know. They are IOR, index of refraction, reflection or specular, roughness, which is specular roughness, and normal input. Inside, it has a standard diffuse shader a correction unit for roughness, which by default behaves a bit strange in Blender, and a custom reflection known group, which is the most important here. Inside this group, you can see that diffuse shader is mixed with glossy shader as usual, but it also has a custom Fresnel node, which takes into account the roughness. And it is mixed with the base reflectivity, or specular values, to drive the proper balance between diffusion and reflection depending on the surface angle, roughness, and reflectivity. Normal maps affect all the above-mentioned nodes. This simplified metal node group has only base color, which is specular color, but no rim color value, as I don't ever use it. Then again, IOR, just in case, roughness, and normal. Inside we have a single glossy node, 
a custom free now setup mixed with base reflectivity, which is defined by the value of the base color. In this case, we use metal Fresnel output because this node group behaves a bit different for metals and dielectrics. For metals, this custom Fresnel will give a black value in the center of the sphere for a facing angle. And for dielectrics, it will give 4% gray in the center because any substance reflects at least 4% of light even when we assume that the material is non-reflective at all. For metals, we don't need this correction. You can learn more about it from the sources I've mentioned in the beginning. To have two separate nodes for metals and dielectrics is okay until you only have the objects in your scene which are made 100% of any of those, or when you use separate materials for the different parts of the object which are pure metal or dielectric. But very often our 3D objects are so complicated with lots of overlapping materials that it might be better to use, for example, a single material node for the whole object and create specific textures which will define the look of every part, whether it's metal or dielectric, in a dedicated software for texturing. Such a node is sometimes called the Uber shader because it does everything for you and is suitable in every case. Later, we will see that Pixar Disney and Pixar Surface are such types of shaders. In Blender, one of the ways to get the Uber shader is to combine our two separate nodes into one and make them work in the metalness workflow. To do so, you simply need to put them together inside one node group and mix in the mix shader, the factor value of which will be the metalness input of the Uber shader. Thus, this grayscale image, for example, describing the boundaries of metallic parts of the surface as white spots and dielectric parts of the surface as black spots, will switch between the two shaders for the respective areas. The metalness workflow also means that we do not use specular maps at all. Assuming that the specular or reflectivity of dielectrics is more or less the same and can be assigned a fixed value. For instance, in linear workflow it can be 0.04 and in sRGB 0.22. In our case, even 0 will work, as I also noticed in Andrew's video, because our custom free nail node for dielectrics will add its 4% gray or 0.04 anyway. The reflectivity of the metal surfaces is taken from the albedo map. Such maps usually have the letter M in the end and are called albedo M because they contain both the color information for dielectric surfaces and for metallic ones, where color hue defines the metal tint and the value of this color, or its luma, defines the base reflectivity of the metal surface. Pixar Disney Shader works only with the metalness workflow. As you can see in Quixel Dido, we can set the export preset for Renderman Pixar Disney, which will have four textures, albedo M, metalness, roughness, and normal. Roughness and glossiness maps are similar and opposite to each other. In roughness maps, white color, or the value of 1, is for rough surface, that's why it's called roughness map. And in glossiness map, white color, or the value of 1, is for glossy surface, and that's why it's called glossiness map. It's that simple, and you should only be aware that you plug roughness map into roughness input, or use invert node if you have glossiness map and roughness input. As we covered all the basics of the PBR theory and learned how it practically works, it will be much easier for us to understand what random man shaders do. Let's start with the old Pixar Disney. The four inputs which are mentioned above for the blend Uber shader are absolutely identical – base color, metalness, roughness, and normal. The only difference is that this shader has also a specular setting which might confuse you. This specular input cannot be used for specular maps in the specular PBR workflow, which we will be talking about in a minute. As the description hint says, this parameter is the approximation of the index of refraction, or IUR, and not the specular, or reflectivity, as we now understand it. In Blender, the specular value of 1 gives a mirror-like result, which looks like a pure metal, and in Pixar Disney, it doesn't change much. I found that the minimum value of 0.001 in Pixar Disney 
equals an IOR of about 1.1 in Blender for non-reflective smooth surface, and the maximum value of 1 equals an IOR about 2. Later, we'll have a practical example of using PBR textures with this shader. And now, let's move to the last theoretical point. Pixar Surface is a more sophisticated shader than Pixar Disney, and it has basically become a true Uber shader, which can be used for any material you ever need, except hair, so we'll study it step by step. Diffuse Sector has the same base color and roughness parameters, but it also has a new gain value, which basically reduces the luma value of the base color, making the material look wet or faded. Primary specular is the most interesting sector. We are allowed to choose between artistic and physical modes, where artistic mode is the choice for PBR workflow. First of all, we need to set the correct specular model in the advanced settings. The Beckman model is set by default, but you will only need it for perfect mirrors or polished chrome materials, and for all the rest, we need to change it to GGX for the appropriate look. Next, we have face and edge colors and their names themselves may confuse you from the beginning, because when you see the word color and the color picker, you may think that this is an instrument to add some glittering, funky colors to the object, as I saw in some tutorials, and you certainly can do so, but their main purpose is to define the grayscale value of the surface reflectivity by the luma value of the color, and to enable Fresnel effect. And only in case of metals, these parameters may also introduce some color tint. So as you already know, everything has Fresnel. And at the grazing angle or at the edge, all the materials are 100% reflective. It means that the edge color should always be white for all the electrics and most metals. And you can tweak it a little somewhere between 0.6 and 1, because as you can see in the graph, rubber has indeed totally reflectivity at the edge as well as chrome, but the shape of the curve is such that we can perceive its maximum only somewhere at 80%. But if you leave this value black, as I saw many people do, you will lose all your Fresnel. Edge color is your Fresnel. Fresnel exponent parameter changes the shape of the curve in the graph we saw in the beginning, and usually you don't need to touch it. Face color is the base reflectivity parameter at the facing angle. As you remember, for dielectrics, it should be somewhere between 0 and 20%, and for metals, 60 and 90%. This is the point where you should be aware of the unique behavior of Blender in comparison with Maya. Let's set the face color value to 0.1 and compare the result with our Blender shader with the same settings. You can easily see the difference. But if we compare Blender result and Maya Pixel Surface Shader, you will see that there is not much difference anymore. The point is that the color value of 0.1 results in 0.01 for RGB in Blender and 0.1 for RGB in Maya, which means that instead of 10% reflectivity, we got only 1% in pixel surface shader in Blender. It is connected with linear and non-linear workflows, and I hope developers will take a look at this. Meanwhile, you can use RGB values to define the amount of reflection. Another difference of the pixel surface shader from the classical PBR approach is that changing the face color or base reflectivity does not automatically decrease the diffuse amount to the degree you would expect. When we need to make a metallic material, for example, and for that we need to set the face color pretty high, the diffuse color will still be there and you have to set it to black manually or make sure that your PBR textures have black areas in the albedo map for the metallic surface areas. Now let's take a look at the physical specular mode and I would like to quickly point out a couple of bugs for developers right away. First, when there are two objects in the scene which have two separate materials based on the pixel surface shader, 
but one of them has artistic model and another physical, when you select one after another, the settings for these different models don't change in the properties panel. You have to choose the model you need again to get the settings back. Another bug is that IOR parameters in physical mode simply do not work. We know that their values should be somewhere between 1 and 3. The same is confirmed by the hint. But currently in Blender add-on for Renderman, you cannot set these values higher than 1, which means that Fresnel in physical mode for Blender does not work at all at present. Whereas in Maya, you can set these values using the real numbers. But even in this case, you should only use physical mode if you are provided correct IOR and extinction coefficients and there is no way how not to use it. Because it is very problematic to provide these parameters in textures to drive them. And the age color parameter order has the same description in Blender, changes its function according to the Pixar documentation. In physical mode, it becomes a multiplier of the reflection. It does not define the base reflectivity and cannot be used with specular textures strictly saying. Also, you will always get some result, even if you put wrong textures into wrong inputs. Because no one will ever know whether you expected to get this look in the result or it was just a coincidence, which turned to be more or less what you expected or not expected. Unfortunately, I've seen many people making tutorials on PBI and Renderman without clear understanding of how it should work, and I was confused myself. That's why I decided to figure out what's going on and help others too. So let's see the practical implementation of these workflows. For the practical example, I've used this famous blend monkey Suzanne, which has three material slots for the head, the eyeball, and the eye pupil, which I used to make an ID map for the texturing purposes. Later, we'll use only one material for the whole object. In Quixel Didu, I've created a project with Renderman Pixar Disney preset, giving me the texture set for the metalness workflow. The pupil received a bare gold material, the eyeball a bare silver material, and the monkey head received a painted wood material, which consisted of several layers. After adjusting the settings and exporting the textures, we will try to recreate the same look in Renderman for Blender. So for doing this, I have assigned a single material for the monkey with Pixar Disney shader and added three texture nodes in the node editor, Albedo M, Metalness and Roughness, and one normal map node. Albedo M with the linearized option checked goes to base color, Metalness goes to metallic, Roughness goes to roughness, and normal map goes to bump normal. All the texture files are loaded, so we should get the similar result. As you can see, we got what we expected right away, which makes this example successful. So let's move to the last one. The base model for Pixar Surface example is the same monkey. I've only created a separate project in Didu with specular PBR GGX preset, which gives us texture set for the specular workflow. All the materials on the monkey are the same, so after exporting them, I've assigned a new material with pixel surface shader and added three texture nodes, albedo, specular, gloss, and normal map node. Albedo, with linearize option checked, goes to diffuse color. Specular goes to primary specular face color. Gloss, after inverting, goes to primary specular roughness and normal map goes to bump, which is a global input. All the texture files are loaded, so again we should get a similar result. As you can see, what we got is what we expected. The only point I've noticed in this workflow is that when you use glossiness maps, simply inverting them may not be enough to get the expected result for the roughness behavior, because again, it has to do something with interpretation of the grayscale values in connection with gamma interpolation for nonlinear image data, which means that in this case, let's say some 95% glossiness may not be interpreted as 5% roughness, even after inverting. There may be some discrepancies. 
So in this example, I had to make the invert factor value 0.9 to get some roughness back. If you know the proper way of dealing with linear, nonlinear, or roughness glossiness textures, please leave your comments below. In case of Substance Painter, you can now easily pick up any PBR workflow which suits your needs and export the same textures as we mentioned before. That's it. I hope this video was useful and helpful, at least for some of you. You can find the script or the text version of this tutorial in the description. Please feel free to give your comments or remarks if I was wrong in something. And thanks for watching. Bye.